Okay, thank you, Elaine. Um, it's great to be back here in St. Petersburg. Uh, I, I didn't really know how to prepare for this talk. And last week, Oleg sent the speakers an email um, laying out what the, the themes of the meeting were. And I, I tend to take things rather literally. So part of the email said we were interested in you know, developing STS in St. Petersburg, and part of it said, um, how might STS uh, shed some light on possibilities for the, the new Skolkova Institute? Uh, and I find myself sitting at home thinking about that. So that's what I'm going to talk about, for better or for worse. Um, Are you just... Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So I've got some minimal PowerPoints. They're just sentences that summarize what I'm going to try to say. So I wanted to talk a bit, very briefly in general, about STS and then specialize the talk. The first point that I thought it was important to stress is that STS is its own field. It's not a servant of any other field. We don't exist to help out scientists and technologies. STS is a descendant of the field that used to be called history and philosophy of science. And you wouldn't ask historians why they're doing their job, they're just historians and philosophers. So we have our own agenda too. To be very brief, I would say that the focus of STS as a field is to understand science and engineering as practice. The question is, what's it like to be a scientist or an engineer? What's it like to do scientific research? Um, this is in contrast to the old way of thinking about science as just a body of finished knowledge. What is the work that surrounds and produces knowledge, for example, is one of the questions of STS. Having said that and insisted on the autonomy of STS, I want to say that STS can nevertheless, um, is nevertheless very relevant to all sorts of concerns. I think it is a useful field of study, but it's not ever going to be useful in a determinist, causal, linear fashion. You don't call in an STS expert and say, you know, what are we, what are we going to do now? STS is useful um, in the sense of illuminating, shedding important light on difficult real world problems. And I'm going to talk a bit about how this goes. The most obvious use for STS is that most people out there in the world know almost nothing about the technical side of science and technology. So they have to think about machines and scientific theories as given things, as if they appear from outer space. But STS can help people here to understand science and technology as real situated historical products as made by real people in specific situations. So STS helps to make possible public, critical and constructive engagement with science and technology. It brings these activities down to earth. This is very important, but I think perhaps it's not so relevant to our discussions today. So we can think about a different angle. My own work has focused for a long time on trying to understand science as culture and practice, trying to understand the hard work of producing new knowledge or making new machines. <laughs> Innovation is the key word these days for what I've been studying for a long time. And I think these kind of studies, my kind of work, can feed back into scientific practice, in, in, can feed back into scientific practice in interesting and important ways. How does that go? Well, when Oleg uh, sent us his email last week, he also sent us some PowerPoints laying out a vision of what the Skolkova Institute will be. Um, and I was struck by several references in these PowerPoints to the Skolkova Institute as an ecosystem. 
And the, the word ecosystem was accompanied by images of people putting pieces of a jigsaw together. I don't know where this PowerPoint came from. Is it yours that you sent to? You'll see it later. Today. Okay, right. So we're in a kind of time warp. I'm talking about something you'll. No, no, it's the Skolkovo Foundation people who sent oh, it to okay. me. It's Oleg and Artem are the authors. So one of them will comment upon it, I hope. All right. So one concern at Skolkovo is to produce an ecosystem, uh, yeah, an ecosystem of different sciences. Uh, different organizations that will translate the products of science and engineering into the market and commercialize them. And the image was putting jigsaw pieces together. Uh, interdisciplinarity is another currently popular word for this idea of putting different disciplines and fields together, though we might think about inter-institutionality, inter-organizationality something that goes beyond academic disciplines. So what do we know about this process of putting the jigsaw pieces together from STS? Most strikingly, what we know is that attempts to foster innovation through interdisciplinarity often don't work. They fail. The jigsaw pieces don't join up to one another. It's really hard to establish a real research ecosystem. Um, just to give you one example, a student of mine in Exeter, Jean Harrington, just finished a PhD on current attempts in Britain to translate stem cell research on animals to the clinical treatment of people with heart problems. And translation from bench to bedside is the way they put it. This is an incredibly heavily funded project in Britain. Millions and millions of pounds have been sunk into it, and very little has ever come out of it. Why? This is what Jean ended up asking herself. And the answer is that the lab researchers on one side and the doctors on the other side have got their own cultures and research agendas. And these keep them apart. They have different career structures, different publishing criteria, grant application procedures are evaluated differently for the two groups, so that their trajectories just don't fit together. The pieces don't match. They don't lead into one another. And this is the typical situation in uh, trying to create interdisciplinary ecosystems. And I think one function of SDS is simply to point this difficulty out empirically and to analyze what's going on. Interdisciplinarity, etc., is fine as an idea, but it's really very difficult to make it work. And the people who design institutes, like Skolkova, for example, need to think very hard about this problem. They need to think much harder than British funding agencies have thought about it, for example. Um, I can come back to that later on. But I can go a bit further here. Fortunately, I once did a study, wrote a very long paper, about the so-called second scientific, no, the second industrial revolution of the second half of the 19th century, a process sometimes called the wedding of science and industry. Especially, um, I studied the relation between academic organic chemistry in the uh, universities and the dye industry in Western Europe. This coming together of academic science and industry um, was historically enormously important. And it was a very successful example of interdisciplinary or in interinstitutional integration. That process in the second half of the 19th century is what led us um, up to places like MIT and Skolkova today. The key point that I want to emphasize about this successful establishment of an academic industrial ecosystem was that all of the elements that came together, the jigsaw pieces that fitted together, were themselves radically transformed in this coming together. It wasn't that existing pieces magically fitted into one another, but all of the elements were, were tuned, mangled, as I would say, to align them with one another. <laughs> 
chemistry in this process became something new. Um, at a very technical level, Kekulé's benzene ring theory, if you know about this, was part of the key, this development in theoretical chemistry, was absolutely central to the joining together of academic research and industrial production. Industry was itself transformed, so were the universities, new ways of teaching, new career structures appeared, and even the law itself was changed, the German patent law had to be rewritten to make this junction of scientific research and industrial production work. Um, so we could say that um, it was necessary for all of the institutions and bodies of knowledge and practice that came together in this, the second industrial revolution, it was necessary for them to be tuned, adapted, and mangled in relation to one another. And I also did a study of the development of science and technology in World War II, where exactly the same kind of thing can be said. Right. There's the citation to my paper. And there's the citation to the World War II paper. Um, what does this show us? It shows us that interdisciplinary innovation depends upon ad adaptive changes in the culture and practice of the groups and institutions that come together. And that kind of reciprocal adaptation is just what didn't happen in the example of British stem cell research that I mentioned. Is there any recipe for making these adaptations happen? No, there isn't. There is no algorithm for doing it. The last 150 years of history in the West has been one of experimentation with ways of trying to foster these transformations. And often these experiments fail. There's no magic formula. In America, MIT has been at the very heart of this process and pretty successful with it. I once wrote a paper in which I talked about a kind of double panopticon centered on MIT. The panopticon uh, tried to create institutional ways of making the interior of MIT visible from outside and at the same time trying to make the use, potential users of academic research visible from inside MIT, a kind of reciprocal process of visualization. So the key point here is that adaptation is the key issue not just trying to put things together, but thinking about how they're going to adapt and change in relation to one another. Um, to carry on with this just a bit further, I want to say that STS knows about interdisciplinarity and inter-institutional processes. We've studied those kinds of things. Um, but the ambition might also be not just to know about these kinds of processes, but to take part in them. Maybe that's another way in which STS can be useful. And without being <laughs> possibly too immodest, I want to talk about my own recent experience in this regard. Um, I, I do find myself becoming a part of these kinds of things. For example, two weeks ago, I was at a workshop in Copenhagen which was trying to bring together Danish roboticists and architects together in a collaboration. A couple of weeks before that, I gave a keynote talk at a conference on the history of media art. This summer, I was at a meeting that aimed to bring Chinese medicine and systems theory together. In a couple of weeks' time, I'm going to be at a meeting on anth the anthropology of material culture, and then I'm going to give a talk on environmental sustainability, then I've just been invited to a management conference in Paris. And I was even invited to chair a session at an IT conference in India on biological computing. And this isn't really supposed to be reading you part of my CV. The question is, what's going on here? Why, why should I get invited to all these weird things, which I never used to get invited to? Yeah, I suppose it's just becoming famous, getting old, isn't it? Right. Uh, but uh, I, I thought maybe it was because I recently published my book on the history of cybernetics in Britain, in which I argued that cybernetics was a science of performative adaptation, 
and I showed how cybernetic approaches in all sorts of fields hung together with one another in what I called an anti-disciplinary formation, anti-disciplinary being something beyond interdisciplinary. It seems to me that a new kind of inter- or anti-disciplinary paradigm is emerging across many, many fields and institutions. And it's a paradigm that thematizes questions precisely of performance and adaptation rather than the production of knowledge for its own sake. And I think the reason why all these people in very different fields invite me along is that participants in this new paradigm want to know how to think uh, directly about their own work and about how to relate to others. And that's where my kind of expertise hits in. Well, I've just got this much to read. Can I do that, Ole? <laughs> so I think this kind of integrate, positive, constructive, integrating function might be a significant future role for SDS. And it might be important now in thinking about how to design the Skolkova Institute. The key question is how to make institutions like that adaptive at all levels, running from the ground level of the science itself up to all the organizational levels that attempt to, create, to connect research to the market. What would adaptive structures for management and entrepreneurship look like? That, I think, is the key question. And one thought that uh, strikes me at this point is that it might even be appropriate to design a real adaptive architecture for the whole institute, one that could change and adapt to whatever the institute turns into, which is not known in advance instead of trying to imagine some fixed structure which is literally going to be set in stone. And that's all I had to say. For me, the key message from STS is that if you want to think about innovation in terms of interdisciplinarity, the key issue to focus on is adaptation and adapt adaptability. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. general discussion, one brief follow-up question to end it. <coughs> uh, some of us who are in sociology have been to University of Bielefeld, which is supposed to be a famous uh, factory of the brains in its architectural design, meaning these guys don't have stable walls. And every semester they can move the walls to reconfigure the students and the classes are you produce, uh, proposing something this traditional or something more ambitious in your architecture thesis? <laughs> well, I, I never didn't realize they could reconfigure that place. I always liked the, the University of Bielefeld, but... It's movable. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if I, when I gave my talk on the history of cybernetics here last year, I talked about something a bit more ambitious, which was a building called the Fun Palace that was designed in London in the early 1960s but never built. Indeed, the Fun Palace was supposed to reconfigure itself to go along with whatever uses people found it, found for it from day to day. But the building was also designed to be unpredictable. It was designed to sometimes change in unexpected ways that would suggest to the occupants new things to do. So it was supposed to conjure up new kinds of activities and new kinds of cells. I have some progress in Mongolia, but I have to give a chance yesterday all the social science researchers, well, a good bunch of them, in, in Germany, from Bielefeld, discussing their new future research plans. It seems that that place, they've run out of space, they have to actually build a new building now for their new cluster. And that was one of the issues actually that came up. Would this Bielefeld model work if you had this new building that you're making arguments? It's only 10 yards away, so they'll still be able to get there. But it's interesting. I mean, the, the researchers themselves are debating the architecture of Bielefeld. Yeah, example. very good. You can leave it there. We'll use the same. Uh, well, so we have the recommendation for the mini morgue uh, of so STS and the fun palace of STS. Uh, what, what about becoming more serious? So, who would like to join? Yeah, Michelle, please. Okay, Michelle Lamont, Harvard. Okay. So, I just want to ask uh, Andy, what is performance better? 
Well, it, it's precisely the <laughs> adaptation at the level of performance. Right? So it's what happens in biological evolution. Species learn how to get on with their environments, and the environments evolve and get along with the. So it's it's, perform it's adaptation at that level. It's not purely adaptation at the level of thinking. It's adaptation at the level of doing. Okay, Trevor has to add something. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm struck. I think the metaphor of experimentation is, is the right mm -hmm. metaphor for how to do this. But I'm struck how, in the case studies I've looked at, and, and, and that there's, I mean, there's another model, the sort of MIT model, that, that people build. I mean, this, this, for instance, this synthesizer guy basically builds his own laboratory for mm -hmm. studying sound. Um, I just read the biography of Steve Jobs. It's, I mean, it's a really good biography. And you discover that how Jobs sets up the key part of the whole thing for the Apple stores is he has a laboratory and he basically experiments with different designs of stores until he finds the one that he thinks is right. So it's kind of a laboratory for stores. So there's, I think experimentation is the right metaphor as well. Yeah, but somehow it's, it's also this, these people seem to be able to set up their own laboratories and there's a flexibility in it as well. Um, yeah, so I mean, yeah, performative experimentation is the key. You know, we don't know the future. All we can do is try this and try that and see what's going to happen. I have a question actually to both panelists so that the students understand what's going on better because we're not only catering to the foundation but to the broader academic masses. And uh, my. Well, I already played this trick with poor Vatsan, so I mean, I have to explain in three words what's going on. And uh, if we are to describe the STS tribe in uh, one sentence, uh, how would you define it? Phenomenologically, that's what is being done in STS departments in US and Europe, or some other uh, non-phenomenological way of uh, delimiting what is STS. Uh, of course, Andy proposed some lineage with the history and philosophy of science, but the parent does not define the child, right? Um, well, uh, yeah, go on, try it. Well, I mean, I think also you have to differentiate between the different, I mean, the teaching wing of STS, which is really important for us. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, push this. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so now we have a, a, a graduate from, we've got this. Society, we're teaching, doing a lot of service teaching for scientists and engineers. And I teach this big class called What is Science? for 120 students every year, capital of that. So we have to think about what in the teaching role. And I usually present it in one, one sentence. This is the students in science and engineering. They're too busy being doing problem sets and being in the laboratory. This is one of the few moments in their career they get a chance to reflect upon the actual activity of science and engineering. There's no other spaces in most universities to do that. So I think the teaching mission of STS, that's how I would define it for scientists and engineers. But Annie's not going to define the research mission in one sense. <laughs> I'm not actually very interested in defining STS at all. Um, I'm, of course, I'm teaching at the moment. It's called Cyborg Studies, and it's about uh, what, what's, what's it like to be in the material world, the question of being and becoming and the relationship between people and things. That's what I mean by material. Um, I, I think that's you know, the most important general question you could ask. And of course, it, it kind of comes down to Earth, talking about various sciences and machines, but it also comes down to Earth and questions like Foucault's technologies of the self. I could have followed Trevor's talk with a talk on the cybernetic 60s. I don't think there's any reason to be too limited in, in these, this kind of work myself. Well, if defining limits you, Andy, please don't do it. But there's Steve who wanted to join. Finally, we produced enough emotion in him to wish to move in. No, you press it. Yeah, it's working. Um, I'm uh, with Andy on this. I think it's, um, it's not productive to try and define some sustainable studies. I think it's probably um, uh, a bad idea to try and limit it. Uh, what interests me about science and technology studies is it's very difficult to define. It's a multidiscipline which is constantly at war with itself. So it's disagreeing. I think that's very productive. And it keeps changing very much indeed. Um, we had a, a conference in Oxford a few years back 
uh, on uh, it does SCS mean business? I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, we're one of the participants said, uh, you know, before we can say whether SCS has an effect on business and technology, we must understand what SCS is. We must define it before we can sell it. And I, and I made the point here that um, nowhere in the history of the industry, anywhere on this earth, have people defined their product before they were able to sell it. <laughs> so it's, I think it's, it's a misapprehension to be quite so, uh, to worry too much about getting straight exactly what it is and what's in and what's out. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree with that, absolutely, in terms of uh, definitions. One can, think of, one can say more about what sorts of things is SDS particularly good at when you compare it to other disciplines. So I, I just mentioned I edited this new hand, handbook for sound studies. So in writing that introduction, I had to think about, we had to think, I did with Karen Beckers, well, the historian of sound from Maastricht University of the Netherlands, we had to think about um, what particular advantage does SDS offer in a field where they're already reading definitions of sound studies out there. And for us, it was the materiality of sound that SDS is particularly good at dealing with. So, you know, there's a word, uh, materiality, you can throw that in, you can start to cash out what that means, with particular examples of the material production of sound, the attendance to the details of how particular sounds are produced from bits of technology. You often get into technology when you start talking about materiality. So I think you can start to say what, what we're particularly good at, what comparative angle SDS has in compared to other disciplines for addressing certain sorts of topics. Okay, well, having listened to our peers and colleagues from UK and US, uh, I see that there was a Russian wish to comment. Uh, I wonder whether Victor would prepare at a certain point, but I see Mikhail who would like to interject. I mean, there's also a big element of 
chance. Uh, so, you know, when I was long, the important thing about this development in the second half of the 19th century was the first one to kind of glue together academic research and industry. Uh, depended, apart from anything else, on finding a fabulous collection of material substances. These molecules, if we want to think about it in terms of molecules, just happen to be great things for spinning out a certain kind of scientific theory, and they were great things for dyeing cloth, they were very important. That's why they were important. And it just happened that the way the theory developed and the industry developed fitted together, right? Nobody, um, without the Thomas Pynchon has got a great quote about this. We have to look into the heart of certain molecules to think of it. And without those molecules, nothing would have happened. But given that they were there, it becomes very interesting to look at the way directors of uh, academic uh, chemical labs actually moved into industry and spent 20 years developing. You, know, you, you could synthesize a, a a dye like indigo in the laboratory, but then it's an enormous, enormous amount of work to scale that up to an industrial scale. And tremendous flows of researchers between the university and industry. And flows of materials, you know, pure chemicals coming from the industry back. Um, so there's an element of chance, but you can try and create the situation to exploit it. Okay. Uh, Michelle has a question, but I wonder whether Victor has to comment something. <laughs> okay, well, so first Michelle, then Victor, because, uh, okay. <laughs> Why don't you ask Victor's question? Give it to him. So my comment is really about the institutional settings that might favor or not, so the kind of cross optimization between the industry and the market, which we, uh, I mean, the industry and research that we both talk about. I'm thinking about uh, universities such as MIT or Harvard, which are extremely driven by the need to generate money, which means that engineering schools are built on the premise that you will get patents that will then feed into the university. And I happen to be uh, serving on the, uh, the uh, high level committee in France which uh, is uh, struggling with the puzzle that in France this is not happening at all. You know, the Haut Conseil de la Science de la Technologie are trying to figure out how can we get French uh, industries and uh, French universities to, to collaborate more. And it is not only that there's, I think, all kinds of legal and institutional barriers to doing it, but there's also huge cultural resistance because, you know, the money is viewed as corrupting and incompatible with the world's research. So in some ways, I'm tempted to ask both of you, for your research, for instance, uh, for one could derive a kind of basic model from the mold case that you gave us. You know, I mean, in terms of really, in terms of steps that, that Mr. Mold uh, followed, uh, you know, it's a path-dependent process that is not entirely uh, idiosyncratic, right? I mean, the question of feedback effect from the users, the question of marketability, and I'm wondering whether one could really think about, you know, abstracting the model and, you know, seeing if there's any correspondence to the, the, the second revolution that, so now to be critical of this, yes, I would say that um, one of the weaknesses, if you think about it, in tension with sociology is the issue of generalizability. Not in terms of uh, law, but in terms of thinking about how are processes transposable from case to case. So, uh, to the extent that STS defines its identity as an intellectual process, uh, as an intellectual project, in part in tension with social science disciplines such as sociology, I'm asking you whether we could think about the next step as really trying to think uh, comparatively between such case studies. And not only in terms of the kind of scholar, the literature, the scholarship that you've done, but also in terms of understanding better the social processes that would help the French face, you know, for them it's a drama. I mean, this is like the kind of, you know, whatever uh, the, the, 
you know, French engineering in relation to American engineering. That's what they are tying you to. And on this committee, by the way, I'm the only social scientist. More than half of the committee is private industry representative. And uh, for some reason, they don't think that it's relevant to have social scientists there, which really makes me wonder about the social impact of this. Yes, I mean, I think it's wonderful that in the context of the project that LA is, you know, that you're now exploring here this weekend, STS is taught to be useful. But in some ways, I mean, is it that useful if there is a reluctance to think about social processes? Well, I, um, I, I have nothing, whoops, nothing against thinking about Oh, totally is that right? Cool. Yeah. These, are, yeah. these are funny microphones. Everybody yeah. sees it's on, not you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, it, uh, to defend SDS at the moment, what it does, it develops concepts. So one of the concepts in my research, you'll see the role of users. You'll see another concept. When I thought about cells, I said the mediators. And these are familiar concepts, I think. You know, Bruno Latour's group would be also thinking about these terms. And what do, you can also think in general terms, what do mediators do? Well, they move. People that move are always interested. So salespeople move. So people that are moving are interested as well. So we have, it's not a, we have, we have a, I, I would say it's, we have a, a set of concepts and heuristics, but you, what you're calling for, the sort of systematic comparison, you know, sort of hasn't, I agree, has yet, not yet been done. And it'd be interesting to do that. To think about, I mean, Andy's case study is, is very, very different to mine. It's very clear. The sorts of technology that appear is different. And also, mine is one where there's two sites. It's, it's intriguing because there's this guy on the West Coast who's in the middle of high Ashbury, in the middle of psychedelia. But that, he doesn't develop the technology that becomes successful. You need this 50 engineer who's isolated, but they both have big research universities near them. Booklet had been at, at Berkeley, Moe at Cornell. And something about the isolation of them actually works to his advantage. So it's a really complicated, but I, I agree, I, I, I'm not against thinking about comparison and trying to generalize. But I think we're already doing some of that in SPS. I hope so. Yeah, Andy, yeah. Um, I'm not sure that I agree that the next step is to do uh, comparative sociological studies. That's what we were doing sociology, but I'm not. It's not my way of doing it. Uh, you know, for me, the next step is to think about you know, questions of ontology, what is the world is like, what, what the world is like, which is, doesn't fit into the frame of classical sociology at all. Um, you said something about social processes. Certainly, I think we all study them already. The, 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 maybe a more constructive way of saying something in response to your question is, uh, yeah, so for me, a, a key concept, concept is something like open-ended adaptation, experimental finding out what works. Um, what I was just talking about, what Trevor's example points to, is precisely this process of open-ended adaptation between all sorts of actors. If I was, you know, if you're thinking about real institutions and how to create them, the question is, what stops? institutions being adapted? What are the social structures that get in the way? And that question used to be a kind of abstract theoretical question for me until I moved back to Britain, where I found myself working in a totally non-adaptive organization. It's hierarchical, it's top-down, it's fixed on a set of measures to the expense of anything else. Um, we need to perhaps look at models of <laughs> really bad ways of doing things. And, and the, that PhD dissertation I just mentioned is <laughs> a less, less in, emotional version of the same thing. Why don't those things, why can't the, the clinicians and the people exp experimenting on mice adapt to one another? What's getting in the way? Um, yes, okay. Okay. Thank you. Vincent? So I, I, I also hear uh, with Michelle's uh, comments. Um, uh, yeah, it is. It's on. And uh, I think she's actually much more friendly to us than what she what she A current concern from people who get exposed to SDS and who come out of that exposure by seeing only basically um, I mean, a few case studies, and a few very detailed case studies, and that they don't see 
we don't see a statistical model approaching these, uh, these questions. Uh, they don't see that as much as they do want. And, and they don't really know what to do with, the, the, um, with these, you know, these, these, these elements. Like we could study labs after labs, and we could, have, we, could have, we could have the same set of concepts, but you know, each lab would be slightly different. And we wouldn't sort of aggregate, or we wouldn't calculate on that. What I find really interesting is that if you, we now have a few interesting studies of a different mode of reasoning than the statistical mode of reasoning. And I'm thinking of studies of the EU central bank, the uh, German central bank, and the New Zealand central bank by a scholar who is not well known but really interesting. His name is Doug Holmes. And he is basically, he's doing three work to respect. And what he discovers is that in the center of this sort of calculation, in centers of calculation, central banks, what are they doing? They're just crunching numbers. Well, they actually don't do that. What they do now is they actually send teams of quasi-educational calculators in the field to figure out what the next, you know, what the next stage of these markets are going to be. So that these guys have not been doing up to the early 90s, a very basic, you know, survey, you send surveys to um, heads of corporations and get back that information and then process that. And you try to figure out what to do with your interest in on that basis. And they figured that they were just not getting any. So they actually moved something that looks like power and not sending people and basically spending time to these companies. And then and the big question is how do you how do you consolidate that? Because you have all these teams of investigators coming back to the central bank and then so what do you do with the and so what's interesting is you know that we balancing between doing you know you know, basically statistics on um, their clients. I mean, on the uh, people who are to bring need money in the future and talking to them. And they realize that you know, they actually need to talk. They, they need to have people who can talk to these companies and yeah, be like sensors, very subtle sensors of what the next, you know, what their needs are going to be, what the markets are going to be. And they translate that into a policy. And so they are still trying to figure out how to, how to translate that. But they are really, they are really eager to keep that first phase, which is, you know, we are, we just visit these guys, and we don't, we don't really know what to ask them. Just it's like an open uh, in, um, interaction. Okay. Well, thank you. I wanted Victor to say something. Finally, he wants to. And as a way of introducing, I should tell you that uh, this gentleman who first brought a and as a fashion in Russia, and then he just nailed the last uh, nail into its coffin mm -hmm. in the latest introduction to the book on a and <laughs> Yes. Yeah. 
video myself when I have special suspicion that people from Scope are going to give money for research and start saying like, okay guys, here's what is supposed to be done, you know it for sure, and that's, let's look what's going on really. Uh, what's interesting with STS looks like something that helped to understand that kind of stupid opposition to transcription language. It looks like something that helps to go beyond the stupid, uh, a little bit ideological statement that there is something like formal rationality and things are supposed to be organized like that, and now we, ethnographers, will show you the truth. Uh, so, but I still don't understand how it happened. Sounds like Steve has an answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm horrified by this version of ethnography which you okay. uh, It seems to me that good ethnography is not about telling you how, what really goes on, or how it actually is. And I was always horrified that his laboratory life was read as showing what really went on in science. Good ethnography is posing questions, being sceptical, raising queries. It's producing curiosity with the people that you're talking with. It's absolutely not trying to supplement one form of real description for, a, for, for another form of real description. Uh, and, and coming back to, to the earlier comments, it seems to me that um, if you take that seriously as a potentially very productive kind of dialogue with a whole series of people, business, academics, and so on, you don't want to be talking about generalizing. I mean, you know, I'm with, with, with Andy's sort of quasi historical sensibilities on this. Uh, it seems to me that when social science tries to generalize, you get into talking about uh, using concepts exactly about social processes and social institutions. Guess what? They don't work when you try them out on people. Uh, when, you, when you talk to potential clients or potential new audiences for the kind of work we do, and you talk about social processes and social institutions, the eyes glaze over very quickly. You have to find a register for talking to these people where you pique their curiosity, where it's a, a conversation about, uh, about um, questions uh, rather than just answers. Okay, well, Michelle wanted to say something. Yeah. Well, it's very funny. I feel when words like uh, generalization are used, they're like the little bombs because it, it ignites people's epistemological commitments to like positivism, and these are major dividers. I think I could have said the same thing by simply saying, let's think about what both case studies are cases of and what are the similarities and differences. That's really what I'm talking about. It's not at all a kind of comparing view of producing all well that statement, which I take to belong to the prehistory of the social sciences. It's really, I think, when we're talking about looking at social processes and ontologies, we're looking actually at the same thing. For me, whether you're tying this to, the, to sociology as a disciplining process, actually or not, is really much less interesting than thinking about how can this endeavor whatever you call it, I mean, whether it gets the label as yes or not, is fairly uh, irrelevant. Whether we're talking about um, a series of, of uh, discrete studies that are juxtaposed to each other, and then what you end up having, it's like, say, a three-day meeting of SDS, is really performances that are juxtaposed without any sense that we're gaining any kind of uh, understanding from case to case of, uh, you know, are they just just opposed to each other? I'm, in some ways, I, I want to know the whole case. I mean, how does it compare to other processes of, of diffusion of knowledge or diffusion of technology? Is this one totally idiosyncratic and how do is it similar or different? Okay, well, we can take it as a comment if nobody wants to respond. And actually, I wanted to say the following. Олег Алексеев, вы не хотите сказать пару слов или задать вопрос? У нас есть в этой секции еще 10 минут. Или я перейду к каким-нибудь комментариям? Um, well, thank you for this uh, opportunity, but uh, uh, it's uh, my first uh, meeting with STS. Maybe uh, after the presentation uh, of Scope uh, and uh, I asked Artyom to develop a 
our initiations about the youth of the MIT and what the kind of patients wouldn't understand and maybe how it was from a good example to discuss the protocol of Skolkova and uh, on the basis of this uh, we can develop the ISTS after the Skolkova. Okay. Okay, thank you. <coughs> well, then, then, given the fact that we'll have a special section on business and a special section on Russia and Skolkovo, I wanted to stress the academic side of it. And the academic side, which was so far stressed by Trevor, I think, very well, was the following very simple situation. There are lots of engineering schools which teach engineering. And uh, what Trevor stressed is that engineers are not taught how to they do engineering themselves and that's what STS does it teaches engineers about themselves how do they live and what do they do as engineers that was the first thing which of course is very important and serious now I had a president of the future Skolkova Institute of Technology in my office yesterday morning he's uh, an aeronautics and aerospace engineer from MIT Edward Crowley he came and uh, he basically said that uh, he doesn't know the way Oleg Alexei formulates it, but for me he said it's always important that physicists and chemists understand something about policy issues, meaning he more or less kind of recast your suggestion to government talk, because he, he knows that MIT has to sell it to the government very often, so you have to have engineers who can be at least active spokespeople in saying that kind of chemistry we need or that kind of physics we should be investing to. So that's the second thing why it's important. But I think if we formulate on these two roles, we lack the wonder or we miss the wonder of what drives uh, Andy. And this is the wonder at the complexity of the world. Because what I think what STS does to engineers is one thing. But what it does to social scientists it's like when you're aged, not 25, but 35 or 45, and you realize you still don't know anything about the physics of the universe. <laughs> and you've got some years to finally to fill the gap and leave something which is not just pure sociology, but something which is a monumental claim that you're closer to Greek philosophers who knew something both about the world and the human beings. And that's when STS becomes of epo epochal promise. <laughs> And I think that we shouldn't be under stressing. It's basically, it has an impact not only on engineers and the way engineers understand themselves. It's about uh, how we understand ourselves as human beings. Yeah, Trevor. Yeah, I, I just, um, well, I, I echo that. I sort of want to say there's an area also of STS that we haven't talked about, which hasn't yet really developed. And um, Steve Shapen, just at the recent um, a society for social studies and science meeting, joint meeting with HSS and Shaw at Cleveland, said this is that, and I agree with him, we don't actually, because we avoid psychology, we don't talk very much about the actual process of, of invention in terms of individual actors, how, how they come up with these ideas, this, this sense of wonderment that perhaps Andy has with the mystery of the world. And it's a sort of an era we don't like to go into very much because I think historically we've avoided thinking about it. In, in terms of psychology. But I think it's an interesting area that um, I myself have, 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 have written one paper um, which I've been trying to think about. What is it that Mo brings? How can he be this person who can create this new technology? And how do you start to think about invention in an interesting way? So we don't want to go back to the other psychological categories. We have to think of an innovative way of doing it. But I just want to put that out. This is a great research topic that, that SDS and other scholars can start to think about. Okay, well, thanks. Well, I think we, uh, as professors, have monopolized the floor for quite some time. We've got six minutes for students. I'm ready to work as a translator if somebody wants to pose a question in Russian. So I will take the humble position of just translating your questions. I'm ready to перевести любой вопрос студентов по по-русски на тему нынешней э, панели, можно по-английски как хотите. На тему можно встать и спросить, что такое СТС. So those people who are in the back of the room and in the back corners, any questions? Есть ли у нас вопросы? Есть вопросы? 
Uh, okay, Anna has a question, but it's not exactly the question of what is STS, it's some other question. Uh, it's, where, it's about adaptation. When you're speaking about the mini MOG or just MOG. <laughs> I just talk, just a second. So when we're analyzing this, we read uh, Trevor's article on Minimog. So we know about the role of the salesperson, like Van Hoveren or whatever the name is. Uh, yeah, I forgot it. But when, when we translate or transfer that argument into the studies of biology, for example. <laughs> Или sales. So when we do that, uh, the study of biology, how much role we should pay to what humans do, in particular the salespeople of biological products? Yeah, oh, great, great, great question. And um, I, I just want to make a little pitch here. <laughs> As a, the salespeople always talk about pitches, of course. Um, but studies selling in more different contexts. I mean, I've just written an article with a grad student, Asaf Dar, on the neglect in, in, in sociology of selling sales in the world. So there's very, if you, I mean, given the importance of selling as an industry, it's a huge number of people who work in sales. And there are very few, it's very, very understudied. Probably, possibly, because people kind of sneer at salespeople and salespeople in some sense. They don't take them seriously. And um, so, I would have thought if you're interested in biology, you know, the, the, uh, all, these, all these companies that produce these devices and ideas have, have at some point to do the selling of these devices. And there's this, you know, you can find these people, they really exist, they're not so hard to find, and start to study them. And this is, that's this is the starting point of it. I, um, I haven't studied it in biological theories, but I know so little about biologists out of my depth. But I certainly will find these sales forces there and hanging out with them, doing ethnography with them, interviewing them, or doing historical research on particularly important pieces of biological technology and how it was actually sold. It seems to be a really great research project. Okay. Well, I guess Trevor has picked up on his favorite topic about the sales. By the way, Trevor, in Russian, uh, frequently new English words get sedimented into Russian language unless they are in high demand. And in the last 10 years, there's a new Russian word called sales. No, no, sales meaning that's a person who goes into sales. Dr. Scholz in sales, he предлагал мне один продукт. Okay, Anna has a question. Uh, how can we use it for explaining development institution? For example, it's called. Uh, it's all. It's all. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I don't know really what the problem is, right? I mean, you know, my, my study of the 19th century thing was I was trying to show that institutions develop open-endedly along no particular trajectory and sometimes they interactively stabilize one another. I was trying to generalize my image of what happens inside the lab from the micro to the macro. And the conclusion was for me that, you know, very big things are mangled and emergently transformed. Today I was calling that mangling tuning and adaptation. I was trying to extract a kind of general moral from this that you know um, we need to pay attention to adaptation when we're designing institutions. And my later comment was actually we tend to produce anti-adaptive organizations, organizations that deliberately are structured so they can't adapt, and that, that's really the, the problem. Okay. Do we need some distance from our object in a sociological perspective? Well, it was when you explained the epistemological question, but it's very practical mm. in our situation. Can we use this model for searching a moral institution in, in, in development, in the process of development? 
Well, I mean, I think the important thing is what the important aspect of the model is that you know, we don't know the world. We're surrounded by extremely complex systems. We can't predict how they're going to behave. And we have to build that into our way of going on in the world. So instead of having, you know, social theories that freeze organizational structure, we need to develop ways that are essentially experimental and performative, um, trying to find, find out. And that's, that's a very concrete instruction. And you can find real examples of, you know, what, what's it like to try and build a, an adaptive organization? One of the people I studied, Stafford Beer, right, was a big the world expert on the cybernetics of management. His whole concern was how, how can you make adaptation the centre of an organisation rather than something that happens in, in the margin? I don't know if I'm talking about what you're asking me, but I mean, that's the line of thought. Yeah.